So when you think there could be certainty, uncertainty reigns. And it seems fitting that we would invite our insurance commissioner, Matt Rosendale, up here to share a few words. We actually asked um, Commissioner Rosendale to talk about prescription drugs and the work that his office is doing. But he um, would, um, I guess we'd invite you to also take an opportunity to talk about some of the items that are happening at the national scene. Uh, kind of the theme for today is that we know things are happening at the state level, but we also have to be engaged at the national level. And you have been engaged at the national level when you, right when you stepped into that office, knowing that that's what needs to happen and being part of that conversation at all levels. So we thank you for that. We would uh, invite you to say some words on that. Also talking about prescription drugs. And we know from uh, the patients that our physicians see, and also from our physicians, this is one of the top concerns that we hear is the rising cost of prescription drugs and how that can be managed and how that transparency veil might be lifted in regards to how those uh, our prescription drug uh, costs are set. So again, we thank you for coming here today. And uh, I know you had a piece of legislation that was talked about in special session too, and you might want to talk about that reinsurance piece as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody. Um, everybody's making their references to the uh, special session. First, I, I really want to thank the chamber for putting this on and the foundation. Uh, I see Webb's not here, but Bridger's here today. And I really do appreciate the effort it takes to uh, put these, these events on and to gather everybody up. So uh, I'm glad that you all could actually attend. As far as the session, you know, my, many of you know my, my youngest son is serving in the legislature. And when he returned, he's staying with us here in Helena while he's uh, participating. And when he returned at 2 AM, he said, you know, I'm, I'm really accustomed to having a lot more fun when I return to the house at 2 AM than what I just had <laughs> over the last three days, let me tell you. And I said, well, it could be worse. Um, you could be the governor. I assure you, he wasn't having much fun either just having to, uh, to bring everybody in. Um, what I would like to do is start off with some information about the, the actual ACA and, and what's going on. I, I'm going to focus a lot of my attention on, on the pharmaceuticals uh, industry and, and the study that, that we're going to participate with that. But when I was sworn in, I did immediately go in and, and uh, start trying to address the cost of health care for the people of Montana. And it's what I've focused on for, for quite some time now. Instead of trying to make sure that everyone has an insurance product, is to try and make sure that everyone has access to health care that they can afford. And, and that is really where we need to be. And as uh, um, John just said, it needs to be controlled at the local level. The people of Montana and the legislature within Montana can establish what we need to provide to our people. And, and when these mandates and these uh, restrictions come in from the federal level and say, this is what everybody needs to do, it never does end well. It never does end well. Uh, the best quote that, I, that I've heard as of late uh, really summarizes the whole thing. And it came from Dwight Eisenhower when he was serving as our president. And he said, you know something? You can't put someone in charge of agriculture that uses a pencil for a plow and lives a thousand miles away from a cornfield. And that's where we are. We cannot have people that are trying to run our state from, from 2,500 miles away. That's not the way our, our founders intended it. Each of the states are supposed to be able to accommodate their people. And, and I think that the closer that we can bring those decisions back to the state of Montana, the better off that we will all be. I'm convinced of it. So I'm going to jump into the, uh, to the pharmaceutical issue. Uh, we regulate portions of the private health care insurance market, such as individual and small group and Medicare supplement, but not Medicare. So we do not uh, regulate employer coverage, which is about 47% of our population, Medicare, Medicaid, or what's known as CHIP, the Children's Insurance Program. We are the consumer advocate. That is, that is what we are uh, to do. Um, health care costs, health care costs have a huge impact on the insurance rates. That's exactly what's, what's driving it. 
the, the insurers, all they do is run their actuarial tables and say, here's how much is going out to provide this care, and, and our rates are going to be an, a, a component of that. So what we've been focusing on is trying to get folks good information about what is the cost of health care. And we have found that it's difficult to get that information. I mean, if you walk into many facilities and you say, how much does a certain procedure cost? The answer you get is, how are you going to pay for it? And then they will determine how much it's going to cost. And that does not give us the ability to really drill down and, and establish what folks' health care cost is. The past legislative session, the, the uh, regular session, not this, this special session, we were able to support and pass health care price transparency. That's at the crux of this legislation and a federal reinsurance waiver application in an effort to identify cost and to give the legislature the ability to work with my office to develop a plan to accommodate the health care needs of the most vulnerable people within our communities and through some type of a reinsurance product. And whether that reinsurance product had parameters that were, that were defined by by um, conditions or whether it was by price ranges, we wanted to work with the legislature to do that so that the folks that had the pre-existing and chronic conditions, we could, we could address their needs and then give the balance of the population the ability to purchase products that truly accommodate their budget and their health care needs and, and their personal choices as well. One of the biggest issues that wasn't addressed during the session, but it's being looked at during the interim, is studying the cost of prescription drugs, which has been recognized across the board by all political stripes that is a major problem. Our office has a leading role uh, to participate in this interim study. If you were to look at a, uh, a prescription drug and look at the path that it takes from manufacture to the mouth, Okay, to the person who's actually consuming it. It looks like a schematic on one of these laptops sitting there. I mean, it is the most convoluted, complicated path that you can possibly dream of. And every step along the way, there are price points. There's, there's money that, that takes, that transacts, that switches hands. And we've seen co-pays that were actually higher. The co-pay was actually higher than what the cost of the, of the actual prescription was if someone was to go out and just say, I want to pay for that cash separately. So it distorts the whole purpose of having an insurance product to help you accommodate your health care needs. So what we're doing is participating in this process so that we can find out what's causing that, what's distorting this system, what, what's the cause of it. And, and once you discover the cause of it, then you can start trying to address the problem. Drug prices continue to increase at alarming rates, and, and most of you already are aware of that. According to the National Community Pharmacists Association since 1987, total spending on prescription drugs in the United States has increased by 1,010%. 1,010%. Meanwhile, overall inflation in the United States grew by only 125.9% over the same time period. According to Health Affairs, the average annual cost of cancer drugs increased roughly from $10,000 per person, this is, out-of-pocket cost per an individual on an annual basis, $10,000 prior to 2000 to over $100,000 per year per person out of cost by 2012. And that's based upon a study that the Mayo Clinic provided. The rising cost of prescription, prescription medication is not limited to specialty drugs or, or cancer medications. In fact, according to Forbes, which conducted a cost study of generic medications and 222 different medications, the price of generic medications increased by 100% or more from 2013 to 2014. Generic drugs doubled in cost. There are also some extreme cases, 17 different drug groups, where price increases of more than 1,000% were seen during that same time period. For example, tetracycline, which is comp commonly prescribed for bacterial infections, saw a per tablet price increase from roughly 3 cents a tablet 
to $2.36 per tablet, a 67-fold increase in one year's time. And, and no one can explain this. Some other examples, uh, doxycycline, widely used antibiotics, soared from $20 for 500 capsules in 2013 to a staggering $1,849 in April of 2014. Glyco, glycopyrrolate, 20 milliliter, used during surgery to prevent slowing of heart rate, climbed from $65 for 10 vials to $1,277 during the same time period. Pravastatin, sodium, 10 milligrams, a common cholesterol medication, surged from $27 to $196 for a one-year supply. Again, no one can explain this, so we're trying to gather the data up to find out where these price points are and be able to put our hand on saying this is where the increase is coming from. In some cases, the cost of research and development of a drug can take decades, and it is time and that is very expensive. The motivation for drug manufacturers to recoup the cost of research and development can play a factor in driving up prescription costs. And I certainly, as a businessman, understand that. You make an investment, you have to have a return on that investment. However, along those same lines, consolidation of mergers in generic drug industry has contributed to drug rise in cost. Again, when you start consolidating these firms and you start crowding out competition, this is not a good thing. It just, it, it will drive the cost up. One of the reasons that generic drugs are sometimes a more affordable alternative remedy is the competition in the marketplace. And when the generic drug companies merge or consolidate, that competition is eliminated. And so then we get, we lose the benefit of having the competition to help drive those costs down. Another thing that many people don't think about, and that is international roles, uh, international factors play a role in the cost of health care in the United States. Prices for brand name drugs are typically higher in the United States than in other developed countries, which suggests that 300 million Americans are literally subsidizing the drugs for different countries overseas. Another factor in the rise of drug costs involves the role of the PBMs, or the, uh, pharmacy benefit managers. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but this is yet another, another uh, distribution network. The PBMs work with health insurers to administer the pharmacy benefits portion of the health insurance. They also contact, contract with drug manufacturers to place certain drugs on covered formularies, which a list of drugs available covered individuals at network pharmacies. And formularies are typically a good thing so that people can go to and they know that the peer review process is that these drugs are, are, are recommended for certain conditions and, and they can control costs. I've worked with the, um, with the workers' compensation uh, plans around the state and we were able to, to get a drug formulary in place and it's done many things. One, it will help turn and curb the cost of, of pharmaceuticals, but it's also uh, was an attempt to reduce the use of opioids and the high use of opioids and, and to help de decrease the opioid abuse that's, that's taken place nationwide. In exchange for placing certain drugs on the formulary, PBMs are rewarded with discounts on the price of the drug. However, these discounts are rarely, if ever, passed on to the consumer. And there's where we start identifying where the problem is. Instead, a portion of the discount may be passed on to the health insurer and the remaining discount be retained by the PBM. So if there's a discount, this is where we start getting into the place where someone very possibly can end up going in and purchasing a pharmaceutical and utilizing their insurance. And because of the discount structure for the insurer and for the PBM, it would be cheaper for them to pay cash for that item instead of utilizing their, their insurance. PBMs also have agreements with pharmacies. In some cases, an agreement between a pharmacist and a PBM may contain what's called a gag clause, so they can't even discuss a lot of this. A gag clause speaks to a situation where a consumer could purchase a certain drug at a lower price than their co-payment amount. But the pharmacist has entered into an agreement 
that prohibits them from even having that discussion. And they are the ones that typically had that intimate um, um, relationship with, with the consumer, and, and yet they can't even discuss it with them. According to the National Community Pharmacists Association, today just three PBMs, think about this, three PBMs control nearly 80% of all prescription benefits in the United States. That is scary. This affects the pharmacy benefits for more than 253 million Americans. Just to give you an idea of the revenue generated by the pharmaceutical industry, CVS Health, which is comprised of pharmacy chains and, and a PBM, has posted over $177 billion in profits so far already in 2017. Walgreen Boots Alliance, which is comprised of pharmacy chains and a PBM, has posted over $117 billion in profits for 2017. And Express Scripts, who also has a B, is a PBM, posted profits of over $100 billion. These three PBMs have posted more profits than Boeing, than Microsoft, than Johnson & Johnson, than PepsiCo. They, are, they have incredibly large profits. And again, as a, as a business person, I think profits are a good thing. That's how you create jobs. That's how you create a value in your company. You're able to transfer that to stockholders. But when you control so much of the marketplace and it becomes a situation where people cannot compete legitimately, that's where we start having problems. So what are we doing to combat the ever-increasing drug costs? This past session, the Montana legislature passed House Bill 276, which took aim at the gag clauses, which prevent a pharmacist from informing a customer that they can fill a prescription for less money than the copayment amount. So at least now, the pharmacist can have that conversation with their consumer, with their client, if you will, and, and let them know when there is an alternative and a, and a better uh, way that they can accommodate their pharmaceuticals. In our office, we've begun to take a hard look at the pharmaceutical industry. We're looking for ways to empower consumers to make informed decisions about their health care, particularly with respect to pharmaceuticals. And we are in the process of participating in this study, and we are gathering information right now from the pharmaceutical industry to see, again, if we can figure out and identify where these price points are. The Montana legislature has also taken a keen interest in pharmaceutical prices and has set up a, a, a hearing so that we can determine how, what is the best way to try and, and get the pharmaceutical prices more affordable. So a lot of this, again, gets back to transparency. We have to find out what the hard cost is where we are seeing these escalations along the way and then at that point once we have the information we're going to be better positioned to try and, and address it in the 2019 session. This is an issue that must be addressed. Everyone knows that, that pharmaceuticals are a very large portion. They're, it's approaching a, a quarter of, of what the health care costs are for the people in our nation. While there are many areas in both health care and insurance that need to be reformed, there's clearly a need to address the astronomical prices of prescription drugs. The current path we're on is not sustainable. We cannot continue to have these escalations, whether we're talking about the insurance industry or whether we're talking about the pharmaceuticals. We have to, we have to get the cost curve for the delivery of health care to start turning down. And the first step in that is always to identify what is the real cost of these systems, and then we can start addressing what to do about it. Thank you very much for having me out today, and um, I hope the rest of your conference is wonderful.